High school dropout to real estate superstar? That is the story we are about to unpack here on the Bigger Pockets podcast. In this episode, we sit down with Angelo Rumoro, an entertaining, passionate, and extremely successful real estate investor from Ohio. Angelo shares his story of coming to America and building a successful real estate investment company. Before we begin, I do want to invite you to download our free book, The Ultimate Beginner's Guide to Real Estate Investing, which you can get for free by joining BiggerPockets.com, the free real estate investors social network. Just go to BiggerPockets.com or click this link right here to download the book. With that, let's get to the show. This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, Show 89. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everybody? This is Josh Dorkin, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with my co host, Mr. Brandon Turner. What's going on, Brandon? What's going on, Josh? How are you? Good to be back home. It is good to be back home. It is. It is. Yeah. We, uh, for those of you who don't know, Brandon and I were just in New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans for a conference and uh, got to spend uh, a few days together in person, which is uh, always fun if you're Brandon and always scary if you're me. But uh, <laughs> I had a good time. Good. I had a good time. Yeah. We uh, met with a lot of uh, you know financial writers and stuff and had a really enjoyable time walking up Bourbon Street. So that's a crazy area. That is, and and I will tell you really quickly, because I know I pissed a lot of people off when I was talking about San Francisco. I take it all back. <laughs> I take it all back. I mean, all right. You know, I was ripping on San Francisco for how dirty it is. And I was like, oh my God, this is the most disgusting place. And it wasn't really true, but there's a reason for that. And that's because New Orleans <laughs> is officially the dirtiest place I've ever been in my life. Brandon Turner, you were with me. Do you concur? I do. I do. It was very dirty, both uh, physically and uh, I don't know, <laughs> mentally. I don't know. It was an interesting area. I think that was the word we always described it. Interesting. Yes, interesting. yes, yes. So we just anyway. pissed off a whole nother segment of our population, but yeah. Here we yeah. go. All right. Go, we go. go there sometime. It's a good, good city to visit. Yeah, go visit. So, for all a right. day. so today's show, we have an awesome show today. An awesome show. It's really we good. We do. Yeah. We do. Absolutely. So, so uh, we're going to talk to a, a guy who's uh, actually from the great continent of Australia and uh, he's got some really good. He actually investing in the U.S., but he's from Australia. So you guys get the treat of an accent today. Woo! Never had that before. Fancy, fancy. yeah. Look at us. So uh, yeah, let's get to it. Uh, first, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor today, and that is Ninety Nine Designs. You know, every business, no matter how big or small, needs a professional logo. It's the visual keystone of your brand. But getting a logo that both communicates the personality of your business and is totally functional can be tricky. If you're looking for a unique and exciting logo that looks good everywhere, from business cards to flyers to postings and billboards, launch a design contest at 99designs. Logos start at just $299. So visit 99designs.com forward slash bigger pockets and get a $99 power pack of services for free today. So yeah, check them out. Uh, but yeah, let's move on, on to today's quick tip. Quick tip today is jump on the forums. You'll hear why later. We're going to talk about it, but jump on the forums, get active. It builds your trust. And we're going to talk a lot about that. A really interesting thing at the end of the show about that. So pay attention. Nice. Awesome. So today's guest is Angelo Rumora. I, I don't say it quite as cool as he says it himself. I, nope. I I would attempt to actually pull the Aussie thing, but it's just not going to work. So Angelo has been uh, real estate investing for not, not very the past, what is it, four or five years? I, I think so. I, yeah. Yeah. Something like that. I mean, he's done uh, hundreds of transactions, a uh, hundred of them, including his own personal funds. Uh, used to play professional soccer and left school at the age of 14 years old to, to get into that. I mean, the guy is a ball of energy. He's fascinating to talk to and he's building his team. He's scaling his business up and it's a lot of fun. Lots of great tips in this one. So definitely pay attention. And with that, why don't we just jump on? Let's do it. Bring him in. All right, Angela. What's up, man? Welcome to the show. Hey guys, thanks for having me. All right, thank you. And uh, as people can tell, you uh, you have an accent. You can have an accent. Where, where are you from? I sure do, mate. I'm from Australia. Australia, nice, nice. God's country, as they say. It is one of my favorite places. <laughs> I have not been yet. I'm. Uh, it's on my list, like top ten. So you gotta go. You gotta go. I spend time in Sydney, Cairns, Canberra. It's 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 awesome. 
Nice. It's awesome. Well, nice. welcome, welcome, yeah, welcome, welcome to America. <laughs> <laughs> but you, yeah, you're you're not in Australia right now, though. You're right. You're you're here. No, no, I'm here in um, Toledo, Ohio. Okay. okay. Let, let me just stop you right there. <laughs> you know, of all the places on this planet <laughs> to decide to come to from Australia, why Ohio? No offense to all the Ohio people who just tuned out, yep. but why Ohio? Mate, well, actually, I started off with Kansas City. So I was living in Missouri. For, I know. I know, eh? Wow. <laughs> middle of nowhere. No, but um, um, I guess, you know, ever since I started uh, investing in real estate and uh, the first few mentors that I had, um, they kind of taught me to to focus more on trust and relationships um, before actually looking at any stats and demographics of a particular area. Um, and that's, I guess, how I established my, you know, uh, first relationships in, in Kansas City, which kind of progressed on to, you know, me moving to Toledo now. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got Alrighty. it. Yep. All right. So you ended up in Toledo, started in KC. First off, like what, what kind of got you into real estate? Tell, tell us about your background before that. I mean, like what, yeah. what, what'd you do before? I, I know you were a soccer player, right? What, how, tell me, yeah. tell me the whole quick, quick and dirty story. Sure. Well, mate, pretty much, you know, I've been playing soccer since I was five years old. Um, started off playing in Croatia where my parents are from and eventually moved to Australia. Um, and then I got a professional gig at the age of 18 in Hong Kong and, you know, moved back to, to Australia. And I guess I quickly realized that it just wasn't a sustainable way moving forward, um, continuing to play the game. I didn't believe that by the age of 30, I could make enough money and, you know, have a sufficient lifestyle moving forward. Um, so... You know, I, I guess I decided, unfortunately, you know, to, to let soccer go and, uh, you know, started focusing on, on business um, or trying to find another way of, uh, you know, achieving that financial freedom. You know, without having any formal education, the, the first job I could find was a laborer, right? So I was pretty much sweeping floors on dirty construction sites. Um, I was making good money, but I just, you know, I didn't like what I was doing. Um, yeah. And once again, you know, started doing a, a lot of research and, and I got given a book by one of my good friends, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. A lot of the folks on the forum mentioned that book as, yep. as a book that, you know, opened their eyes up and got them started in, in real estate. And, uh, you know, I quickly got a job as a, as a um, buyer's agent for, for a realtor who was a very successful realtor in Sydney. And I, over time, combined the two, you know, my construction skills um, and knowledge with, uh, you know, uh, real estate and working as an apprentice for this successful realtor. And that kind of led me to flipping. Wow. And, and you said no formal education. I mean, you, I, from, from what I understand, you, you didn't even finish school, right? Yeah, man. I'm pretty, pretty formally stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, uh, I mean, tell us about that story. It sounds, sounds fascinating. Sure. Well, you know, when you're looking at playing a sport at an elite level, there's a lot of training that has to be put into it. And then, you know, I guess school and education gets put on the back burner. And, you know, I had the talent to really make it at a at a grand level like in Europe. Um, and to, that's when I kind of decided that the best thing to do would be to quit school. So I quit school at the age of 14 and just, wow. you know, completely focused on on trying to make it big as a professional soccer player. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, righty. So at 14, you're out, you go to soccer, and then you turn back around. That's that's amazing, man. I mean, you, you know, by the way, you know, you say you're formally stupid, but, you, you know, there's yeah. a lot of people who go and spend their lives going to college and master's degrees who exactly. aren't as successful as you are. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I always um, I always like to joke around and, and um, uh, say that, you know, well, actually, there's a saying that says um, formal education will give you a uh, earn your living while personal development will give you a lifestyle, right? I think there was some guru out there that um, uh, quoted that saying. That's cool. That's awesome. That's cool. Let me ask you this then, just from a, if you were going to talk to somebody younger, maybe maybe not 14, but just say a very young person, but wanting to go to college or not. Um, yeah. What is your, I mean, if somebody wants to get into real estate, but they're 18, 19 years old, what's your advice to them? Do you tell them to follow your path or, or go to college still or finish school? Um, not really. I mean, if you can go to college, finish the school. I mean, it's very important to have that education behind you. But I mean, you know, it doesn't mean you're going to be successful if you go to school and you finish that college. I know many people that are school smart, but life dumb, as they say, you know, and, and yeah. everything that I know today and everything that I've learned today, yes, the odds weren't in my favor. Uh, you know, most people said that I was going to end up sleeping under a bridge, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, I really, really focused on achieving success and asking questions of people who are where I wanted to be. You know, I attended various personal development seminars, networked with, you know, very high-end and wealthy people. And, and you know, that's how I learned everything I know today. So, 
you know, the, a lot, read a lot of books, went to seminars, conventions, expos, all of that stuff, and and you know, just asked a lot of questions of people who are where I wanted to be. I mean, school doesn't teach you that stuff. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. And, and, you know, actually going in there and doing it yourself and losing two or 300 grand like I did when I first started. I mean, Ooh. I like to say that was my education, right? <laughs> that yep. was my college paid wow. for. Wow, wow. mistakes learned. Yes. Right? So you, you mentioned like, you know, networking with high net worth individuals and getting out there asking questions. So let's talk about that. A lot of people wanting to get started in real estate are scared like to talk to people, right? They're scared to go and ask for advice and help. You know, that's one of the things that makes the Bigger Pockets Forum such a success is that people do that. But how do you do that in the real world? How do you... How do you just go find somebody to talk to them? Where do you find them at? How yeah. do you do that? Well, mate, as I preach on the forums, just get active. I mean, pick up the phone and freaking call someone. Yeah. I mean, well, not call someone, but I'm sure you can, if you do a quick Google search or you jump on the forum, I mean, everyone's number is on the forum. You can give them a call and if they don't answer, we'll call the other person. If they don't answer, call someone else. Yeah. You know, yeah. I like to preach on the forum a lot too. It's, you know, a lot of it's got to do with the numbers. Sit your butt in a chair, pick up the phone and, and just call people, email people, you know, network on Facebook, you know, bigger pockets, comment. And and eventually when you commit to the numbers, doors start to open. It's it's just absolutely amazing. If you really commit to those numbers, you send out the emails, you make the phone calls. And I mean, just call anyone and everyone that's related to whatever you're looking at achieving. If you're looking at finding a good attorney in Ohio, well, you know, you do a Google search, good attorney in Ohio, and just call the first <laughs> 10 that pop up on Google. You know what I mean? And and eventually, you know, as I said, doors start to open and, and, and the magic happens. That's awesome. Nice. I love that. Nice. I love it. So how many deals have you done now? I just want to know, like, what ex like level are you at today? Yeah. Well, mate, I've done 100 deals with my own personal funds, and I've probably been involved in over 300 deals over the last four and a bit years since I started in real estate. Dang, so what, wow. what, did, what did those other deals, I mean, that's 300 deals that are not yeah. your funds, right? So what does that mean? Well, sometimes I would be a joint venture partner where I wouldn't be using my own funds, but I would have other investors um, coming to the table with their personal funds, and I would just kind of advise them and, and guide them throughout the process. You know, I also did that whole bird dogging stuff, did a few wholesale deals, worked as a buyer's agent in Australia um, where I was sourcing a lot of properties for investors all around New South Wales. So um, that's what I would kind of categorize as, you know, doing over 300 deals. What kind of deals are those? Are we talking about flips or rentals or what are we, what are we doing? Yeah. Well, the hundred deals that I was involved in with my personal funds, they were mostly flips, you know, okay. so I would be buying very rundown properties, even in Australia, same as I am here, you know, fixing them up to a great standard, getting them tenanted, selling them to investors or, you know, just um, selling them to, to homeowners. Okay. Hey, oh, go ahead. I, uh, really quick question. Uh, and we'll get back to what you got, Brandon. Is it any different in Australia or is it the same thing? Just get it, get a cheap property, fix it and sell it. I mean, I'm Maybe. just curious. Yeah, well, I guess, you know, the, the principle behind the whole operation is is pretty much the same, but it's a complete different world here to Australia. I mean, you're looking at a median house price in Sydney of $850,000 yeah, um, yeah. today. And I mean, you know, for instance, here in, in Ohio, you know, we can pick up homes for 10, 15, 20, 25 grand, depending on the class of area. I mean, in Sydney, you know, you, you're buying a fire damaged home for $350,000, you know? So yeah. I guess that would be the biggest difference. But, you know, some, some of the names and the way people word certain things like here, it's rehab in Australia, it's renovation. Those are a few little different things too. The materials used in the uh, construction side of things are also a little bit different. But to be honest with you, it probably took me around six to nine months to actually adapt to the, the lingo used here in the US and the materials used and the difference in prices. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Well, so what brought you to the US then? I, I mean, you kind of talked about it earlier, but what actually was it? I want to do real estate. It's cheaper in America. Let's go there. Well, yeah, mate. Look, I, I built quite a large portfolio in Australia. Um, you know, it was worth over a million dollars in a very short space of time, and a lot of media outlets picked up on it there and, and got a bit of a bit of a write up there. But you know, once again, uh, same as I did with soccer, I was quickly to realize that it wasn't a sustainable investment moving forward. Buying high, hoping to sell even higher. I mean, my portfolio was neutrally geared, but it still wasn't spitting out the cash flow um, that every investor really wants to invest in real estate is to supplement the current job they're working in, right? And and I wasn't getting that in Australia. You know, yes, I was building my portfolio at a rapid pace, but it was neutrally geared. If any issues arose, I'd be losing money because I'd had to, you know, put my own hand in my own pocket to cover the losses. Yeah. And, you know, once again, if you keep active via seminars, expos, forums, you know, you start to expand your mindset and, you know, US property came up as a topic and I started digging into it more. And that was around the same time when prices were pretty rock bottom here. Um, and, you know, 
once again, you know, started establishing relationships here. I was on Skype calls and phone calls in early hours of the morning back home in Oz. And, you know, one thing led to another and I saw how attractive the prices were here, especially in the Midwest, Kansas City, for instance, now Ohio. I mean, you're buying properties for 10, 20 cents on the dollar. I mean, it's a, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. I know that might sound corny, but in my opinion, it freaking really is, you know, so. Oh, 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 freaking hey, hey. Whoa, hey now. <laughs> passion, passion. <laughs> hold, hold your horses, mate. I won't be banging my hand on the on the table. That's all right, right? <laughs> nice, nice. All right. all right, so you're, you're excited, clearly, clearly. You're, yeah. you're you're enthusiastic about this stuff. So, why well, why don't we jump to your first deal? What what did that look like? Well, put me on the spot there, right? Eh? No, you didn't <laughs> expect it. I mean, if you listen to our show, uh, <laughs> you might have known that was coming. But you know, it's well, okay. Believe it or not, mate, the first deal almost got me killed. Really? Um, well, that's an Australian thing, man. We don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and it wasn't it wasn't by a freaking poisonous. Spider that's what I was wondering. Either, yeah, okay? yeah, like the wallaby came in and like sliced your neck as he jumped <laughs> in the, the, the started, apartment. Started boxing me, mate. Standing up on his tail, eh, and hitting me with his. With his, <laughs> with his. Nah, mate. It was um, it was in a regional town in Melbourne, um, yeah. called Mildura. Um, it was the only affordable area, believe it or not, that I could find in the whole of Australia. Around a twelve-hour drive. I believe I picked up the property for around $155,000, three-bedroom brick home, um, put around $15,000 into it and um, revalued it at two hundred and ten. dollars pulled out around $40,000 in equity, and, and off I went to the other one. So did you actually sell it or did you just refi it? No, I refied it. Okay. Pulled out the equity, and then I used that as a deposit and renovation for the property number two. Okay. So how, well, how did that almost kill you? Yeah, that was, I was going to say that's the most that boring, story. boring, exciting story I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, well, well, being a little bit of a psycho and, and, and passionate guy, as you mentioned, what, what I did I is, didn't call you I, psycho, by the way, so <laughs> yeah, well, don't come and kill me. My, my wording, my wording. Um, I would get in the car at like midnight, drive 12 hours, get to Mildura at noon. I'd work all day, sleep for three or four hours. Then I'd do that for five days straight, and then I would get in the car and drive back. And oh. on the way back... Six hours into the drive, I just lost control and I flipped the car at like 80 miles an hour five oh, times. Wow. Oh yeah. my God. Yeah. So very, very lucky to be here. It shook me up for a good six months. I was having all of the vertigo, nausea, vomiting and all that stuff. But um, yeah, lucky to be here. That's for sure. Wow. Crazy. Wow. Crazy. Yeah. Okay. So it wasn't somebody that attacked you. It was just the fact that you didn't want to <laughs> pony up for a hotel and stay <laughs> instead of schlepping back and forth. And Pretty much rushing for twelve hours at eighty miles per hour. Yeah, that's crazy. Pretty much. Well, I'll tell you what. I, I um definitely won't be doing that again. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bananas, man. Well, we're glad you're. Uh, we're glad you're here. So the majority of your deals have been like fix and flip properties, correct? Yeah, that's correct. All right. That's so what what do you like about that? Why'd you go for that for starters? I mean, why sure. why that strategy? Why does that work for you? Well, mate, because that's the only thing I was allowed to do as an alien resident here in the US, right? Oh, really? <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess that makes sense. I, I mean, you know, when I moved to the US, uh, you know, I, I started off with a visa waiver and then I progressed to the B1, B2 visa. And pretty much what the visa states is you're only allowed to, you know, sign documents to purchase a house and sign documents, sign the contract to sell it. So, uh -huh. you know, when I moved here, my goal was to build a portfolio where it would be producing enough passive income for you know myself, my family, and my friends to enjoy in the lifestyle we desire, right? And um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. That's okay. I, I was just going to make another smart, smart Alec remark, uh, yeah. a remark about you. Just you know, you should have just flown to Mexico and walked over the border, and you wouldn't have had to deal with the paperwork. It would have been fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, don't worry about it. All right. So, I mean, fix and flips, there was a reason behind it and that's fine. So as you've gone along, I mean, you, you transitioned from using your own money to yeah. kind of working with other people, right? Sure. Well, not so much. At the moment, I'm still using my own personal funds and you just actually remind me what I wanted to say. The main reason behind the fix and flips was when you fix and flip a property, right? You make a lump sum profit, which after doing three or four properties, you can actually you know, use some of that profit to buy and hold the property for your own portfolio. Yeah. And going back to the previous question, that was the main goal why I actually moved to the US. It's to, you know, build a portfolio to a level where, you know, everyone can enjoy the lifestyle they desire, my loved ones, including myself. Um, but in order to be able to hold that property, I had to buy, rehab, flip, make the lump sum profit, and then maybe fourth or fifth property um, I could hold for my own portfolio and build it to 15, 20 properties. Right? That's, a, that's a great strategy. So yeah. you use yeah. the job of being a, a flipper 
That's to create correct. the passive income of a buy and hold. That's correct. In order to be able to buy and hold investment properties for my own portfolio. That was the main reason behind the whole flipping strategy. Gotcha. So when you were building your portfolio and not just rental, yeah. but flips too, what kind of mistakes did you make in that process? Can you kind of go over some of the, where'd you screw up on in your, in your career? Trusting the wrong people. Really? Very how's, simple. Trusting so? the wrong people. Um, how so, mate? Um, it's, you know, when you put your trust in other people's hands, especially when, you, when you're from afar, right? Um, yeah. You know, I see that topic uh, come up on bigger pockets quite often. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that, that happen which are out of your control. Um, you know, I always like to tell everyone to really, really, really focus on those trust and relationships. You know, without going into too much detail how it happened. Um, but, you know, when you're looking at building a portfolio in real estate or investing out of state or out of country, you really need to make sure that the people you're working with, even if you're investing with people that are based locally, you know, that you kind of have a mutual benefit and, you know, you both have each other's interest at heart. So I guess over the years, you know, the biggest mistakes and the most money that I ever lost was, you know, uh, unfortunately falling trapped to other partners that really did not have my heart and interest. And, you know, they weren't loyal, they weren't honest, and they were greedy, you know, and, and that's now with with the business that I've currently got, you know, those are the three things that I look for in everyone, you know, is, is number one, loyalty, number two, honesty, and, and don't be greedy. Um, yeah. So, yeah. That's, that's great. That's really, really good right. advice. I know I've heard that time and time again from people on the show. Yeah. We make mistakes a lot and it almost always like the biggest mistake people have or the biggest uh, thing that causes a downfall is usually trusting the wrong people. And uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I always so like to say, for instance, sorry to interject, mate, no, but you know, same as on the forum, I always like to say, you know, it's not the stats and demographics that are going to cost you the money, right? It's trusting a property manager that's incompetent or, ing or ignorant that yep. that's going to cause you to lose money, right? Yep. And and all the other stuff, a project, a, a rehabber, an attorney, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, a lot of investors, what I've found is they get caught up in these online calculations of figures and this formula on the 2%. Well, Jesus, mate, I've got no clue what these rules are, you know, and- <laughs> <laughs> and sorry, no offense to anyone that made them up, but you know, you, you know, you can literally buy a house in the heart of Detroit, right? Which everyone always talks badly of. But if just, you just have me. the yeah, <laughs> but if, if if you have the right people on the ground, yes, they might have to wear bulletproof vest and collect the rents with shotguns. But right. if you can trust them, they're going to do the job, and you collect your rents. You know what I mean? Um, vice versa, you can buy the best house in the best street and the best capital growth. Uh, area, right? But if you have the wrong people around you, um, collecting your rents or ma looking after your investment, even if you're there on the ground, you'll still lose money. Yeah. So, so, so how do you, how do you uh, how do you vet people? What's what's your process? Because, you know, as somebody who's been burned, uh, yeah, you've probably changed your criteria on on how, sure. you know how do I know somebody is not greedy? How do you know that somebody is well, not going to screw you? I mean, what yeah, do you, what well, do you mate, do? I've got one elimination question, right? I found that everyone here in the US is very transactional. They just want to do business very quickly. And if you don't want to do business with them, you know, they'll just leave and go work with someone else. The question that I ask everyone, actually, I don't ask, well, I do ask them a question. I say, look, um, it's great connecting. Trust is built over time, not over one phone call, meeting, or, 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 or email, right? Yeah. Would you be willing to spend six to nine months or even longer? building that trust and relationship with me, answering any question that I have and assisting me without conducting any business, right? That's the way that I eliminate 99% of shady operators, be it attorneys, property managers, uh, contractors, whatever it may be. Walk, walk me right? through that again. So give me, give me an example of what that looks like because I think that's really interesting and I, I want to okay. hear more. So for example, let's say you're in a, I don't know, you're a property manager in... Uh, let's say St. Louis, okay? And we, uh, I connect with you via phone, we exchange a few emails, et cetera, et cetera, right? So pretty much I would pop the question where I would say, look, I'm not currently looking at conducting any business in St. Louis for at least six, nine to 12 months, okay? I've, I'm gonna have a lot of questions and I'm probably gonna take up a lot of your time, but there is potential to do a lot of business together in the future. Would you be interested in working with me over those six to nine months, educating me on the market and what it takes to succeed in that particular area, answering any questions that I might have, and just going going out of your way to assist me, you know, to to open up my eyes in regards to you know what it takes to succeed in that market. Um, so that would kind of be the the basis behind that question. Um, Th and that's and an amazing question, by the way. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And what you'll find is that um, 
99% of the operators, you, you won't hear from them anymore after you send them another email or they'll start being very slow with returning your phone calls. Why? Because it's instant gratification. They just want to make money there and then, right? Yeah. They're not willing to wait six, nine to 12 months or they're not interested in building a long-term relationship, right? And this is something that you don't want because one or two houses are not going to give you financial freedom. One or two houses are not going to supplement the current job you're working in. You need to buy 10, 15, 20 properties, right? And in order for someone to be able to run your portfolio successfully, they will want to be doing business with you for 5, 10, 15 years. Not many people can buy 15 properties in one hit and be financially free. Yeah. So it's very, very important that you don't jump in, you don't bite the bullet and, and make a stupid decision. Spend the time doing due diligence on the people more than the area and the demographics. And that's one key question that you know, got me to where I am today. And as I said, 99% of the operators, you will eliminate them with that question. Oh yeah. I was going to say, I mean, yeah. I, 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 I can't imagine very many people would, would do it now. So, so that takes us to the 1%, right? I mean, what do those 1% look like and how, how does somebody find them? Because, you know, clearly you're going to dissuade sure. a huge, huge number of people. And frankly, you know, for those people listening, I mean, that might be a major turnoff. Oh man, I don't, I don't want to keep going through people. I keep getting rejection after rejection, or ignored after ignored. You know, I, uh, you know, how do, well, how do mate, you do that? Yeah, I get you. Look, it, it's worth it. It's worth spending that time to get the right people because if you don't, you're going to be losing big money, like I did. I and mean, I agree. I, I, and I yeah. lost money for the same purposes. So yeah, I'm with and you, it, yeah. you know, it's it's worth spending that time. I mean, I always like to say until you are comfortable with making the next step, and until you feel confident in the in the structure that you've established on the ground, you know, do not let anyone influence your decision. Um, and and um, you know, that's the key. Just spend the time. I guess. You, what, what was your question? You said, how do you find that right person? Once again, pick up the phone and, and call, email, get active on, on, on the phone, get active via emails, you know, contribute to the forum. Eventually doors will open. It took me 18 months to open up this store that I've got in Ohio now. You know, I met a, met a great guy, um, a, a Tim, my, my uh, business partner right now. And we first connected, you know, in late 2012. And it took us a good two years to establish the relationship that we have. And, you know, we decided to, to open up, um, start up a higher cash flow around seven months ago. So, um, you know, but once again, you know, all good things take time. Uh, trust is built over time. And, you know, as long as it takes, uh, just keep building that trust and relationship. You know, it really stands out to me there. You talk about, uh, you know, how trust is built over time. And, and here's something interesting, sure. right? So people will come on bigger pockets on the forums. They go into the yep. marketplace and they post a thread and it says, I'm looking for someone to finance my property or I'm looking for someone to buy my property. They've got four total posts. Uh, they haven't been on the site in nine months and that's how they think they're going to get financing. Then you got other people who are engaging every day that are active, that are asking questions, answering questions. And when they put up a post like, Hey, I'm looking to buy or sell or funding or whatever, they get responses. And that is exactly why. I mean, there's 30, 40, 50,000 people listening to the show right now, you know, that, that are listening to you talk. Yeah, we're what now you got me nervous. Yeah, now I got you nervous, right? <laughs> As you should yeah. be. There's like what fifteen hundred forum posts every day in the forums. I mean, that's a lot of forums, one of the most active forums online, but fifteen hundred compared to 30, 40, 50,000. So I mean, this is just my uh, I guess encouragement to people listening to the show right now is get active, get out there, ask questions, answer questions. They're building now, so it's six, nine, twelve months later, just like you said. When you need something, you have the credibility and the trust to ask for it. 100% agreed. And one of my early mentors, he's got a $50 million business now, and, and he built that entire business on one Australian real estate forum and just through um, YouTube videos also of the properties that he was buying and, wow. and doing all kinds of stuff. So, And to be honest with you, mate, a lot of the things that you know I know today about real estate is through the forums. And you guys, Bigger Pockets, have been a great help, especially when I moved to the US. You know, So oh. thank you. Well, thank nice, you. That's nice. awesome. Here. Yeah, that's awesome. It well, is, cool. It is. Well, cool. All right. So, so we know your story. We know kind of how you got started, how you got to the U.S. and all that. So let's actually kind of shift focuses a little bit uh, and talk about your business today on how you're actually doing what you're doing. Uh, so maybe we just start very basic. Uh, how are you finding properties? Um, I mean, is the one under a rock here? <laughs> no, I mean, any way we know how to, you know, we're, we're starting to implement a lot of, um, what do they call it? Like yellow mail, yellow letters, yep. right? We've actually waiting to receive a package now of, of around 500 postcards, which we're going to be sending out. 
We're doing a lot of bandit signs. We're posting on Craigslist daily. Um, established a lot, a lot of relationships with wholesalers in town, bird dogs. I mean, these guys supply us with a lot of inventory. Once people see that you know you've got the cash to make a deal happen, you'll start getting inundated with emails on potential deals. Another thing that we've also recently done is we've just rented out a new office space, a thousand square foot little building. So we're painting the entire building blue and yellow, which are our company colors, and. It's a very high traffic area, so we're going to put – we really do buy houses on the side because we actually do buy it, right? We don't wholesale them. Yep. No offense to any wholesalers out there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, mate, uh, uh, once again, you know, we if you keep very active, I always keep referring back to, you know, those phone calls and emails and, and you know, um, uh, I guess keeping your finger on the pulse with uh, checking Craigslist two or three times a day. You know, some of the best deals that I've ever purchased were off Craigslist, believe it or not. That's cool. um, so that's pretty much how we find the majority of our deals. We've also got ties with financial institutions um, that like to buy in bulk. And once they hit their figures, you know, they've sent out two or 300 deals that they have left that they're willing to, you know, get off their books to check. We've got around 50 contacts there that we can just give a cold call to and see if they got anything that fits what we're looking for. So yeah, the deals are out there, mate. That's for sure. That's awesome. What, what, what are you looking for exactly? I mean, what style house, what size, what price range are you buying in? And- Everything, mate. just depends. You know, we're doing a lot of A-class stuff. Um, we're looking at doing a lot of A-class stuff in the very near future. Anything that's run down, distressed, needs a lot of work, you know, we're happy to buy it, put the work in and, you know, get it tenanted, sell it to an investor or to an owner occupier. Righty. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, what about, what about, so I'm just kind of walking through your whole business here. So that's how you find them. Uh, we talked earlier sure. a little bit how you fund them, but maybe we can explore that a little bit more. So, uh, I mean, you said you do some of them with your own money. Other times you do JV. Are you raising private money at all? Do you yeah. bank loans? stuff? Like, no, we, we don't do any JVs. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if you're referring to hard money as a, as a JV. Um, I, but yeah, you could look at that. I mean, like, yeah, you could, so, or you could do, yeah, okay. people call it either way, but yeah. Yeah, most of the deals we finance with our own cash. Okay. Um, that's one of the main reasons why I sold out of my portfolio that I had in Kansas City um, and a few other states just to be able to focus on you know, buying uh, numerous properties here with my own cash. Um, we've also got hard money on board that we can tap into at you know, any given moment for any deals that we, if we've got our own personal funds tied up in 15, 20 properties, you know, we can uh, use the hard money to take down a good deal. So yeah, that's pretty much how we finance. Okay. How many do you typically run at one time? I mean, how many deals are you typically uh, in pr- either buying, you know, after purchasing and before closing, how many deals do you have going at one time? Sure. Well, mate, look, we started a higher cash flow around eight months ago and we've done 35 deals thus far. Okay. Um, 35 flips. So, okay. wow. you know, it depends. Right now, um, at the moment, we've got four in the works. Okay. Okay. So I guess we're probably looking at, you know, around that three to five a month. Okay. How do you how do you do that? I mean, because I struggle when I'm flipping a house, I struggle doing one. I've done two at a time and yeah. that was driving me insane. How do you do it? Infrastructure, yeah. Well, mate, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Every every extra penny that I get, I look at bringing someone else on board. Okay. Uh, Once again, you know, yep. formally stupid, right? But I'm smart <laughs> enough, as as Henry Ford said it, I'm smart enough to have smarter people around me doing the things that I can't do, right? So as soon as revenue allows it, I look at getting someone else on board to bump other people out of the current jobs that they're in into a higher role. Okay. So, mate, that, that's the key. You know, we've got two full time guys on board right now. I'm looking at getting another two full time people that, you know, believe in the same vision that we do, that are loyal, honest, and they're not greedy. Right. Um, and, and that's how you can, you know, that's how you can start to increase the volume of your business and what you're doing is by getting good people that believe in the same vision, you know, that want to achieve the same success as you do. So, who are the two guys that you have right now? Like, who was the first hire? What did he do when you hired him? Who was the second hire? Did the first guy's job shift when you made the second hire? And what was the second guy's job? That's correct. Well, we first started off, right? We've got Dominique in our office. She's my girlfriend and she's also um, pretty much working as a PA for me because I freaking type like that, right? With two fingers. So I (laughs) PA, personal assistant. Personal assistant, right. Yeah. So she can, I dictate to her and she does all of my typing. Thank thank God for that, right? So we're going to have to talk about like working with your girlfriend as part of this story too. We'll get back to that. (laughs) Well, well, mate, she's the one that freaking types out all my blogs, mate, because if I had to do it, I wouldn't be able to submit one a week. It would probably be one every two years, all right? So, (laughs) But um, so I've got Dominique looking after all that admin stuff, you know, the leases, the contracts, Tim and myself. I mean, we were the attorneys, the accountants, the property managers, the project managers, the, the hard money lenders. We were the whole lot. Right. And eventually, as we started increasing revenue, you know, we managed to um, hire Josh, who's now on, not Josh Dawkin, another guy. Right. <laughs> I secretly <laughs> work for Angelo. <laughs> 
That's it. So, um, you know, he's pretty much uh, our director of operations and um, he's looking after all of the property management and day-to-day stuff. He also project manages the jobs. We've got Matt on board now who's going to take over the whole role that Josh is doing in regards to the property management. So we're just going to bump up Josh into more of a director of operations role to overlook what Matt's doing. And Matt is going to be in charge of all of our property management, collecting the rents, you know, updating the property management system, which we are yet to buy and all of that stuff. And then what I've found is eventually I'm going to have to get, uh, you know, one or two people just to also assist Matt with managing the properties because it can be quite time intensive when you're starting to do a lot of sales and a lot of volume you know, you're going to have to have extra people on board just to assist with all of the management. Property so, management is key. Now, do you do, um, prior to that, were you using um, outsourced property management or were you doing it all yourself? We were. We were outsourcing property management, which is great. Once again, as long as you find the trustworthy uh, property manager. But what I found is I would rather just knock on the door and pop my head in the other room to see how things are progressing with a certain property, right? Yep. In order to have a successful turnkey business, you have to have a, a big emphasis on property management. I think if you have in-house property management, of course, and you abide by all of the Ohio State laws and regulations, it will complement your turnkey business to a, a you know significant level. And that's so that, what your business is. You, I mean, you have a turnkey business, correct? That's that, correct. That's kind of what you uh, what you do. I, I mean, uh, you do your own deals, but you're also taking money from from you're selling deals to people as turnkey, correct? Sure, that's okay. correct. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. All right, well, and, and we'll probably get back to that. So how do you find the guys to work for you? What do you do to, to get those guys? They find me. What do you mean they find you? Once they see how crazy and passionate I am, they're like, <laughs> what's this guy doing? I want to do the same thing. You know the saying, mate, if you stand for nothing, you fall for everything, right? Most people these days do not have a purpose in life. They, right. they live their day for whatever reason. I mean, they might as well not be living it. And then, and then they see Angelo, right, who's this freaking crazy weird accent <laughs> dude, right? And he's just talking about real estate and going 100 miles an hour. And they're like, I guess, you know, they, they literally jump on board and they believe in the same vision and I that I do and they see what my purpose is and my purpose is everyone around me. Yep. I don't do what I do for myself, right? Because if you do what you do for yourself or the money, it won't last. It won't push you out of bed every morning at 6 a.m. to get you in the office. And, and you know, I guess once again, you know, Josh was working at a bank. He was a branch manager and he, you know, took a significant pay cut in order to join our company just because he loved what we were doing. We give him absolute freedom to do what he wants whenever he wants, and he believes in the same vision that we do. And he gave us a good story about it with the Wright brothers, right? There was some guy that supposedly got funded by the government to invent the flying vehicle, but he never did that, right? And the Wright brothers made that flying vehicle themselves with no budget at all. And then this guy that was funded by the government, I can't remember his name, he actually went to inspect this flying object that they invented, right? And instead of joining them, right? He was jealous because they were the first ones to invent the vehicle. He just kind of, you know, gave up and went his own way. And Josh gave us an example. He said, well, I didn't start a higher cash flow, but I want to be a part of it. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. That's so cool. find, find people who agree with the passion, be passionate to, yeah. for starters, and then find people who have similar passions or they'll find you. And that, that, that is kind of how Brandon came on. Board well, yeah, I was going to say that, right? Like yeah. Josh is passionate about BP and his passion. Like, uh, you know, I became passionate about BP because Josh was passionate about BP yep. and I jumped on board there. And that's kind of how I got my employees and my real estate stuff too, is, you know, like they, yeah. they saw how passionate I was about real estate and they want to, yeah. So passion definitely inspires passion and, and yeah. a great leader has to have that. And I think, uh, it, ru- yeah. it, it rubs off mate. You know, as yeah. I said, a lot of people stand for nothing. They fall for everything. They don't have a purpose. They don't know why they wake up every morning, you know, and, and I definitely know why I wake up every morning. And then when, when others around you see that, um, you know, they want to be a part of it. They want to jump on board and, and, you know, they want to do great things and, you know, call it luck. I don't really believe in luck. You know, I just think it's, I don't know. I don't yeah. know what it is, but you know, it just, once again, you know, if, if you do the small things, right. Um, the, the bigger things just seem to fall into place. Yeah. 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 You need a little less passion, man. Just a little bit. <laughs> Why? You know what? Everyone we we just did a, we just did an hour show and a half hour. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I love I, it. I, yeah, I love it. Everyone's been saying here in Toledo that I'm too intense, and I keep telling you, you're freaking too old. <laughs> <laughs> Serious? Nice. Come on. Nice. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All yeah, right. So, yeah, yeah. Thanks, wait. But by, how old are you, by the way? Twenty-six. So okay. Wow. So you've been you're you're a young pup, man. That's awesome. Yeah, that, that is kick awesome. Kick my back, you'll kick my butt. But yeah. <laughs> At least no, in a soccer game. Well, cool. yeah, okay. yeah. 
So how, how are you, how are you managing contractors? Actually, I want to talk about two different things. One, because you just mentioned you're yep. young, but first of all, I'm going to ask about contractors. How do you find them? Um, well, how do we find contractors? Um, good question, mate. We did have quite a few dramas with contractors over, over the years. I, I mean, that's one of the things that, you know, if you find the good one, eventually something turns sour over three to six months, they get greedy, they want more money or they just start doing stupid stuff and then you got to look for a new one. How do we find contractors? Word of mouth, I guess. You know okay. what I mean? Um, you know, we, we, we speak to, uh, I guess, our contacts and we see if anyone's got a trustworthy contractor that they can refer us to. And then when we find a good one, we just like to stick with them for as long as possible. Um, you know, we had a few issues with, with a few contractors a couple of months ago. Um, right now, we've got a few good guys that you know are trustworthy. Um, their prices are good. They do decent work, and um, you know they're hungry for more work. So I guess you know to be completely honest with you, you know that's one thing that is is you really really never know because it could be good for six months and then all of a sudden something turns sour and and you know they either get busy with other work and you can't keep them on board. Once again, you know looking at bringing that in house very soon. Yeah. Um, so. Hopefully, you know, we can we can maybe get one or two maintenance guys that uh, we can save a few call out uh, maintenance costs on because every single time you get one of your main contractors to go out on site, you're looking at, you know, $100, $150. And if we've got someone on board full time, you know, over the long term, it will really um, uh, assist us with that bottom line and they'll be trustworthy, they'll be loyal and honest and not greedy. And, and I think um, that would be another good way to go about things moving forward. That's cool. I've, I've been debating the same thing for many years. I mean, should I should I take on on uh, you know uh, a maintenance guy on staff, even if it's part time? Yeah. You know, I I flirted with the idea back with resident managers. I've had resident managers in and out of my apartment complex, and you know it's it's been okay. Uh, I, I I know for me it comes down to the reason I still haven't yet. And I've said this on previous shows recently is that I'm just not that good at managing people, and so the idea of having my in house guys like I don't think that would solve my problem. My problem is I'm just not good at managing people. So once I get over that yeah. issue, then I think I'd be better. Well, mate, you know, you don't have to be good at managing people. You can find someone that is good at managing people. That of is course, a good point. Once yep. you, you know, once you build your portfolio to a to a level where it allows you to actually hire someone full time to manage the people, that's what we've done with Josh. Yeah. You know, um, with with Tim and myself have bumped ourselves out of that role, and now Josh is looking after all the contractors, and we want to we want to get these people to work under him. So he pretty much just answers to us. Now, Tim and I have the experience of successes and failures. Um, and you know we're willing to um, share all of our experiences with with Josh, um, and you know it's up it's up to him to to take over that role of of you know managing the contractors and the property managers, so we can do other things. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Well, so how do you get people to take you seriously at a young age? I mean, you're you're a young guy. Uh, I know I have that too. I mean, you got you got facial hair like I do, right? So you know it helps a little bit. But <laughs> well, I've, I've got bald patches though. So <laughs> okay. I, I keep telling, I keep asking my dad, mate, when did you get a freaking beard? Because mine, <laughs> mine's bald at the moment. <laughs> so, so how, I mean, how do you do that? I mean, how do you get in your your line of work? How do you get people to give you money to buy a house from you to to all that yeah. stuff? Like, what are your tips on that? It's not easy, mate. You know, it does take time. Um, I guess here on the ground is when they see you writing the checks, they start taking you seriously. <laughs> okay. That's a good point. <laughs> Cause, yeah. Cause, cause they see that you're the guy paying them. They're like, wait a minute, what's going on here? Why is he paying me? And then they're like, okay, he must be the main guy. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, uh I can't really give you an answer there. Um, for, for the other contacts that we've had, I mean, you know, time is bliss. I mean, if, if, you know, if, if you spend that time, I guess, and, and you start doing good things and, and people, you know, I guess they give you a chance Um, you do one deal and you do well and then they give you another chance. And then, you know, once that trust is built, I mean, it's not really a big issue. Um, yeah. I haven't really, I, to be honest with you, I, I kind of had it in the past. Um, what I've done there is, is if I believe that someone is, is, you know, not taking me seriously because of my age or because of my weird accent. Or because of my good looks. Um, <laughs> sorry, I had to throw that one in there. Right? There you go. There and my, you go. And my, and my fluoro shirt, right? I'll there you just go. Get Tim. I'll just get Tim, my business partner, to go chat to them. And I'll tell him to give him a few slaps in my name too. No, that's a joke. Um, <laughs> no, he's, he's a little bit older than me. You know, he's around 44. So he's kind of that, that more mature figure where... Uh, he's just got that aura of authority. Um, I'm more of a young, groovy, fun, you know, passionate guy. And and if I see that someone is not taking me seriously, I'll just you know get Tim to go chat to them and and sort them out. So nice. is that him? Him basically acting as the boss, or is that him basically saying, "Hey, if you got an issue with Angelo, get get the f out of here. Uh, yeah. We're not going to work with you." You know, he's in charge, and you know, get on the bus, or you know. 
It depends, mate. It just depends on the situation. You know, we have had a few hiccups here where certain uh, uh, wholesalers, for instance, did not really want to chat to me for whatever reason, I guess I guess because of my intensity. So, you know, they just talk to Tim and vice versa. And there's a lot of people where personalities just, you know, clash. You don't get along. Well, you know, that's fair enough. Let's just try and stay as, as mutual and diplomatic as possible. And if you want to work with Tim, work with Tim. If you want to work with me, work with me. And as Josh uh, asked a question, if not so much, he tells them to get F, out of here. But, you know, if I kind of see that I'm not taken seriously, I just, you know, Tim and I discuss it in the back end and I say, Tim, look, I think that these people are looking down on me. They think I'm a young kid. They think I don't know what I'm doing. So I think you should step in and, and you know, just continue the relationship with them. So, yeah. And I think, and that's, I think that's great. Yeah, that's great. I mean, we, we have, you know, I, it's a different thing, but, you know, I, I we'll, we'll have situations where, you know, people who know me know, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty nice guy, but, you know, I could be a New Yorker at times. And <laughs> the, we, we actually just got back from a conference and, uh, you know, it's it's really funny, the dynamic with Brandon and I, where, you know, people think I'm, I'm kind of jerky at times and, and, and yeah. like... Brandon, you know, I'm just, I'm just intense. I'm just a New Yorker. I'm just, I am yeah. who I am. Right. And I'm like, all right, this guy, you know, let me, let me send Brandon in to, to kind of soften him so, up a little bit. Mate, we would call, we would call that a wanker. You're a wanker at times in Australia, right? Uh, no, you know, the word, don't associate wanker with me, son. Uh, be cool, dude. Be cool. Come on now. If you wanted to take someone if you wanted someone to take the edge of your intensity, you should have chosen Brandon, mate. He's not that much of a pretty face. <laughs> no, he's not, pre- he's not a little bit more prettier. He's right? not pretty, but he's nice. He's nice. He's like a he's like a cat. I'm like I'm like a cat. Oh, cats are pretty though. Come on. <laughs> they are very if pretty. I'm really feeling it that day, right? And I'm like, I'm on edge. I'm like, Dominic, you got to come to this meeting with me because you're a pretty face. You can take the edge of my intensity. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. Man, that's really funny. funny. All right. Yeah. All right, I'm 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 putting us back on track here. Enough of my pretty face. <laughs> they call right. me a freaking wanker. What <laughs> the hell is going on? Did you really? <laughs> Am I allowed to say that on this show? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me. All right, he's cut off. He's gone. We got rid of him. You got Don't rid of call him. Call me a wanker and be on my show. <laughs> <laughs> all right, he's back. All right, I'm not no, gonna get rid of him. We like we like Angela. All right, all right. Let's get back on all pace. Right. All right. So we talked about we talked about how you find properties, how you are financing them, how you are fixing them up. Uh, how about selling them? When you go to sell them, are you guys? Uh, are you? I mean, I, I'm assuming are you a real estate agent now, licensed or no? And do you use an agent no. then? Okay, so you're no, not. I'm, okay. I'm not. Um, team and myself aren't licensed realtors. And okay. um, the reason for that is, if we were, it would limit us to the certain things that we can and cannot do. We do have Josh in the process of right now of getting his realtor's license. Okay. We're also looking at at literally bringing an in-house broker too. Um, pretty much, mate, with a turnkey business, I mean, you can you can buy properties in your own name and sell them. You don't yeah. need any license to do that. So with the selling, you know, uh, once again, I like going back to, you know, leave, um, leave no stone unturned. Um, you know, we were very active on all social media platforms. It took us over 12 months to establish two sales channels that we currently have. One of them's in California. The, the other one is overseas. And, um, you know, these guys pretty much sell all of our inventory at the moment. So, so whatever we supply, whenever it's ready, um, the property is pretty much sold before we can even get it finished, to be wow. honest with you. With that being said, you know, we're, we're looking at connecting with uh, SEO tech expert to, to do a little bit of, uh, I guess, build our brand and assist with uh, certain marketing strategies. Um, you know, I really want to create the squeeze pages um, and see if we can tap into the East Coast and West Coast. Um, maybe see if we can, uh, you know, work with a few Canadian investors um, you know, the East Coast is, is is quite expensive. The West Coast is quite expensive. Real estate in Canada is expensive, very, very similar to Australia. You know, so there's a lot of investors looking for that cash flow. Yep. Um, so that's kind of, uh, we're looking at tapping into into those channels, those areas there, um, and see if we can get any investors on board that would want to buy our turnkey properties. Okay. Oh, so let's talk about turnkey a little bit. I mean, I, I want to, yeah. there's Here a lot of di- drama. Right. <laughs> well, no. Here we go. There's a, lot of, a, there's a lot of debate on turnkey, right? There is a lot there of is. debate on turnkey. This is a forbidden topic, man. I don't even want to get involved <laughs> no, in this. This is, this is why it's no, listen, I mean, for yeah, you know, we, we gotta we gotta cover the, the verbatim topic here. So yeah, so I, so I want to know, I mean, when you say turnkey, first of all, because a lot of people have different defin- definitions, what does that mean to you? Like, do you do the rehab? I mean, assuming you do, uh, do you property manage? What does turnkey look like for your company? Turnkey means that you just collect the checks in your account every month when the rent is paid. You There's, being me, somebody who gives money to you. The investor. That's correct. So the investor has to buy 
a complete turnkey property that needs no work whatsoever. The property is tenanted. It's got a lease in place with a good tenant that's willing to stay for at least a year to two years. And, you know, all they have to do is is give me a call or anyone here in the office a call and ask them, you know, how's everything going? Is everything fine? That's pretty much it. Hands off. Completely hands off. So, I mean, you put a tenant in. The the property presumably is in great shape. I'm assuming you're doing all the capital improvements before you put a tenant in. Is that correct? That's correct. Everything is done. There's no work that needs to be carried out on the property. The Are you doing like new roofs every time? Are you doing new, I mean, new HVAC? What, what's, Depends. what's going- Depends on what condition the property is in. For instance, here in Toledo, you know, because we're only focusing on B-class areas, you'll find that some of the houses have great roofs on them, so you don't really need to replace them. But, you know, whatever it takes to make that property a sustainable investment for the investor. So, you know, we look at things that we predict might occur and cost the investor money in the, in the long run. All right. Gotcha. Gotcha. So that's what we will pretty much fix. So as I said, just depends on 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 what condition the property is in. I mean, I've bought properties where you literally need to do nothing to them except a bit of plumbing. We just missed out on a great deal that was completely rehab, believe it or not, and foreclosed on. It just needed new plumbing in the basement. It needed absolutely nothing else than that. So wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, just depends on what condition the property is in. So, gotcha. so here's the complaint that people have. Those people who don't know the, yeah. the debate with turnkey, I mean, there's a few things, but the argument is that turnkey providers charge a lot more. I mean, obviously you're paying more, you're paying retail essentially uh, for the yeah. deal. You're not going out and finding those $5,000 properties or $20,000 properties and doing yeah. the work yourself like I do, right? I do my own work. I find my own properties. Why should I choose or why should somebody maybe choose turnkey over just going out and do it themselves to pay a little bit more for that? Or is it more? Well, I guess for the privilege of not having to um, you know, put in the work themselves, I, yeah. I never I never try and sell my model at all. You know what I mean? Um, there's there's plenty of buyers out there all around the world that you know can can buy my product. I never sell anything on bigger pockets, and you can look through all of my thousand posts. You know, um, but if someone wants to do it themselves, I encourage them, mate. Go out there, do it yourself. You know, spend two years building the relationships and trust, and then you might be able to do it yourself. Um, I guess the only thing that you get with Turnkey and the big you know forbidden zone there is. A lot of the turnkey operators, the figures promised on paper aren't actually the true genuine numbers. Yep. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Those those numbers aren't genuine. A lot of the numbers don't include, for instance, 20 to 30 uh, percent deduction on maintenance vac- and vacancy. You commented on one of my blogs there regarding that, Brandon, in regards to how much you take off on your bottom line. You know, uh, a lot. That wasn't of turnkey- really your blog. That was more your girlfriend's blog, uh, <laughs> from what you told me. But you know, okay. <laughs> Okay, well, she she typed it up, and I got Josh to help me with the yeah, with the, the yeah. dictation, right? Okay. Likely story. <laughs> Whatever. Here we go. He got me back on the wanker bit, right now. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the wanker now, buddy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am. Should I take my headphones off? No. Yeah. <laughs> okay, where were we? Oh, uh, we're going to turn key. Brandon, please, they they give yeah help. He rudely interrupted. <laughs> he did. Re- Can you please? It's part of his show, man. It just comes to the <laughs> yeah, you, were, you were talking about how a lot of turnkey providers, the numbers don't match what the actuals are. And I, I see that all the time, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I actually feel bad. Like, I listed a property a while ago on the marketplace and I put like all the real numbers, right? And then I felt bad because, like, like, I think nobody, ex- nobody, uh, expected that to be real. So everyone was like deducting other things. I'm like, no, I already included that. Oh, I already, like, that includes that. Like, uh, yeah, because they expect that people expect to be trying to get ripped off or whatever. So, uh, I guess, exactly. well, go ahead. that's kind of, yeah, sorry, mate. That's kind of, uh, I guess on, on bigger pockets, you know, it's, it's a very forbidden topic. And when I, I've even taken turnkey off my, um, keyword search, to be honest with you, I don't even want it to pop up <laughs> anymore. <laughs> no, but yeah, look what I found false numbers on paper, um, or not genuine numbers, and those uh, end sale prices are much more uh, than what the actual property value is. But then again, I really can't give you an honest opinion on what the value would be in a C and D class property because it's a roller coaster. There, the, the prices are all over the shop. You really don't know. So that goes back to property management. I guess even if someone does sell your property for a little bit more than what it's worth, but if they can hit those numbers with property management and get you all your money back in four or five years, well, well, happy days, Matt. You know what I mean? Yeah. You got what you got what you invested back, right? Over the five years, you've still got an investment property which is hopefully well kept, and you can sell it to another investor. If it's a C and D class property, if it's a B class property, well, you know, then you can even potentially sell it to an owner occupier. How yeah. does somebody know that the numbers are legit versus not being legit? I mean, that yeah, as as a you know, there's a new investor, they they hear about your company and you know, twenty other companies out there. Uh, how do they go about figuring out if you are giving them all the details, all the numbers? Is it just hey, listen, 
<laughs> here are all the numbers. We include vacancy. We include CapEx, you know, uh, 10% sure. for that. We include this, you know, go ahead, shop everybody else. Make yeah. sure they're including that. Here's our prices. You know, we're going to take care of all that stuff. Mate, it, it's a great question. And you thought you were probably going to stump me on that question, but you didn't. Okay, so I'll give you an answer. Uh, I didn't think anything, <laughs> man. I, no, I'm, I'm just because you're a wanker doesn't mean I don't okay, expect more right, of you. All right, Mr. Wanker. <laughs> so pretty much that goes back to that trust and relationship. And that, that key question that I said, are you willing to build that trust and relationship with me for six, nine, 12 months before I feel comfortable investing with you or through you or whoever it may be. I mean, you're, you're really never going to know if those numbers are true unless you actually bite the bullet and, and invest and buy the property, right? But over time, over six to nine, 12 months, right? And if you can, for instance, get a few uh, other people to speak to who have already bought through that turnkey operator, you can get testimonials from them. They can maybe give you insight in how their investment properties have performing, you know, Real estate is not smooth sailing. Issues arise, tenants leave, people lose their jobs. So it's a bit of a, a murky water area. You know, it's very hard to know what the exact figures are. You know, I can tell you right now that C and D class properties, whoever's promoting 20% or higher, those numbers are going to be very, 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 very difficult to achieve and hit. Very difficult just because, you know, you need full-time property management. I always like to kind of do this estimate. If you're doing C and D class properties, you would want your property management company to have one full-time employee looking after 50 units. Okay. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. So in order to be able to have a chance of hitting those numbers and in and the lower class, the area is the higher the volatility. And you know, one year you might get 25%, the next year you might get 0%. So yep. yeah. Yep. That's, I mean, that's a really good point, right? C, yeah. C and D properties do require, yeah. I mean, I have a lot of like, I would say C class properties and they require a whole lot more work than the, my, you know, B class properties do. I mean, definitely do. Yeah. So a uh, very yeah. good point there. And nice, I, I like nice. that. I like that concept you're talking a lot about. I mean, we, we kind of came full circle. We talked about this early on about, uh, you know, the people you trust, and if you can find the right people, they can deliver you numbers just as good, if not better than the than the crappier properties that you might think because, you know, th they're the ones helping you hit the numbers, not the property itself. I like that. That's correct. So very awesome. cool. Well, all right, before we go on uh, and move on, I want to ask you one more question about uh, where do you see yourself going forward? Like, where is your company headed in the future? Sure. Well, mate, we, uh, you know, uh, the purpose of this company is bigger than myself. Um, and, and, you know, I'm going to repeat what I said before. I don't do it for myself. I don't do it for the money. I would like to add as many new employees to this business as possible. And as soon as revenue allows it, I'm looking to add someone else. Uh, you know, it's, it's, there's no better feeling than giving, you know what I mean? I love writing out bonuses. I love helping people out and, and, you know, I love to work with people that believe in the same vision. So I want to grow the business to as far as it can get, you know, um, we're already looking at doing Michigan cash flow. You know, we're looking at starting up Cincinnati, Columbus, you know, having separate offices there. I mean, sky's the limit, you know, sky really is the limit. And, um, uh, yeah, I guess I see a higher cash flow. We've got a little bit of a goal there. I would, I've got actually here above my head in the office. I, I would love to get on that Inc. 5000 list as the fastest growing company. Uh, well, top 5000 fastest growing companies. Nice. Um, I guess that's a good goal for us to have. I'd love to get on that list. And, you know, we are looking at getting more guys on board, um, you know, helping them achieve what they want to achieve, helping their families. And, and um, you know, that's that's what I want to do. Add as many people on board as possible, open up as many markets, you know, and, and help as many investors out as we possibly can to also achieve their goals. You know, win, win, win for everyone. Great. That's great. Great. I love it. All right. Well, why don't we, uh, why don't we move on to uh, the, my favorite segment of the show called... It's time for the fire round. Oh, this is scary. <laughs> no, one, no, one, no one told me about this. That's all right. <laughs> all right, we're going to fire some questions at you. Uh, you do hang out in the forums, so you probably know a lot of these questions already. These are questions that real people have asked in the forums, which people listening can get to at biggerpockets.com slash forums. And we're just going to fire them at you and see what you got to say. So number one, what is the biggest red flag that alerts you to a disaster flipping, fix and flip property? Foundation issues. Good, good. That's uh, I would say the exact same thing. So if oh, you're gonna that. if you're gonna buy a fix and flip and there's foundation, then it means they didn't do their job. Is that what you're saying? Or is it? Are yeah. you saying you know if there's a property that has foundation issues before you fix and flip it, it's going to be a disaster? I'm which saying before you fix and flip yep. it, I wouldn't even touch it. Yep. Okay. So you don't do foundation stuff. You no, if there's up. if there's foundation issues, I mean, I wouldn't even touch it. I just pass it. Pass okay. it. No matter how you know the saying, 
It doesn't right. matter how um, the bad bad the property is, the price can't fix, right? Yeah. Um, well, if it's found if it's got foundation issues, you know, it doesn't matter how cheap the price is, it still won't fix the foundation issues. So, yep. <laughs> in my opinion, I just wouldn't touch it. Okay, Go ahead, righty. Fair enough. Fair enough. Would you rent to somebody who's committed a felony in the past? Potentially. What would what, uh, under what yeah. circumstance? Yeah. Not sure. I would have to evaluate the circumstances. For instance, right now we've got someone that's got a felony, but they were happy to let us speak to their current employer that they've been working for for the last two years and their parole officer too. So we're actually considering that at the moment, um, renting a property to them. So we'll see how we go. No, we've got to we've got to do another podcast next week, and I'll yeah. tell you. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Nice. I, I'm, I'm curious. All right. Next one. What tricks have you learned to harden or bulletproof, or they call it tenant proof, your properties? Like, is there anything that you do knowing it's going to be a rental uh, that's going to help it last longer? Yes. Insulate the roof and walls. Lowers the tenant's monthly um, uh, heating bill, which you know gets them to pay the rent instead of the gas, and then you'll have a happy tenant that's willing to stay longer. Oh, I like that. That's a great tip. Uh, that is an interesting, interesting tip. There you go. Aussie knows a thing or two, hey, about US property. There you go, man. <laughs> there you go. Maybe you're not such a wanker. All right. All right. What, uh, what do you hate and what do you love about managing properties? Hate about managing properties would be when someone gives me a call and they want their light bulb fixed or something miscellaneous as that. Yep. Yep. Um, what I love about it is collecting the rent on the first of the month. Isn't that freaking <laughs> obvious? Yeah, that's, I love uh, it. That's something to love for sure. Cool. Yeah. All right. Last question of the fire round. I think we're going to ask you this. Would you, and we might have asked this last week. So forgive me if we did. I know I've been watching this forum thread on the forums quite a bit. So I can't remember if I asked it, but would you partner with someone who is cheating on their spouse? Oh, that's a bit of a seedy question. What do you yeah. mean by that? Like, partner with someone? <laughs> no, like, not like partner, like the date. <laughs> I mean, like, like if they wanted a, a joint venture to go together on a deal or they wanted to be your par- business partner, but you knew they were cheating on their spouse, would you still, uh, you know, become a business partner with them? Probably not because that goes back to my trust and relationship stuff. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, if, if, if they can do something like that, you know, someone that they should be loving unconditionally, they will then they'll have no problems of, you know, going behind my back later on down the track and, you know, stuffing me up on a deal or whatever. So nice. Yeah. Cool. Fair enough. Fair enough. Good awesome. answer. Good answer. All right. Final section of the show we lovingly call our famous four. All right. These questions we ask every single guest and uh, we're going to see what you got to say. So number one, okay. what is your favorite real estate book? Favorite real estate book. Wow, does it have to be real estate? We're going to ask you business yeah, next, this is, but this yeah, one's this real, estate. real estate. Real estate yeah. related, I guess you could say. Hmm, I can't remember the last real estate book I read. It will probably have to be, um, you know, Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki because that's the one that, um, you know, opened up my eyes to real estate investing and, you know, um, really, I believe it got me to where I am today. So, there you um, go. but then again, I did find out certain things later on that I'm kind of not 100% about with, with that. So, yeah. Okay. Right on. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. What about business book? Business book. Two of them. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill and How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yep. Cool. Nice. Those are both good books. Both good. By both good. Dale Carnegie. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Good stuff. Now, what is your, uh, what about hobbies, man? What do you do for fun? Uh, do you still play soccer at all or nah? Nah, man. Unfortunately, I'm in the office 100 plus hours a week. This is my hobby, my yep. love. Live, yeah. eat, breathe real estate, mate. I love it. Can't get enough. So that's your hobby. You don't do anything outside of work? Nothing, mate. No no word of a lie. I'm looking at maybe pulling back a little bit, but I've got another 30 people I need to feed. And then when they're fed, I might pull back a bit. Do you have like a TV <laughs> show that you like or something? I mean, there's something, anything. Do you like anything besides, <laughs> besides yourself and your business? I mean, <laughs> Joshy, my wanker friend, um, TV is a waste of time. Eating is a waste of time. Just pump the job and do the numbers. <laughs> 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 nice, nice. real estate real estate all the way guys real estate all, all right. or nothing guy all or nothing all right good deal all right final question final question from me what do you believe sets apart someone who succeeds at real estate versus someone who gives up or they fail or they never even get started in the first place good question mate you have to be willing to keep going when you think you can't go anymore no matter how hard it gets and i like it what barbara corcoran says in a video that i recently watched where no matter how many times you get hit, you just got to pick yourself up and keep going. 
you know, and yeah. um, I think that's what it takes to succeed is just keep going. Doesn't matter what other people think of you. Doesn't matter what other people say. Doesn't matter how unintelligent you are. If you, I honestly believe if you push hard enough, you will push that mountain out of the way and see district water views. Alrighty. Great. Great. Awesome. Great. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, uh, where can people find out more about you? Obviously, uh, you've mentioned Bigger Pockets a couple of times. Uh, you have a website for your company? Yeah. Well, they can, if they Google my name, Angelo Rumora, um, I'll pretty much pop up on the first page of Google. That's Angelo with an E. And um, same thing with Ohio Cashflow. If they Google Ohio Cashflow, we'll pop up on the first page of Google and they can find out more about myself. What's the URL? And the company there. What's the URL for it? URL. Yeah, the link www.ohiocashflow.com oh there you go nice and easy cool. cool awesome man well listen it's it's absolutely been uh, it's been fun yeah it's, it's been, been fun, fun and Thanks, we re- really really appreciate having you and, and uh, we'll look forward of course to seeing you back on the forums and if anyone has any questions for Angelo uh, you can hit him up on the forums or on the show notes at biggerpockets.com slash show 89 Angelo thanks so much man we'll see you around thanks guys I appreciate it thanks for the time all right, thank you. All right, everybody. That was Angelo Rumora of the Bigger Pockets Podcast, Show 89. We really want to thank him for being our guest on the show. Lots of fantastic information, lots of great tips. And uh, we really, really do appreciate him giving us some time. So uh, yeah. thanks so much. Uh, otherwise, as Angelo said, guys, jump in the forums. There's We got a whole lot of listeners here. And you know, building your credibility, building your brand, starting to network and meet people, can't be easier. You literally jump on the forums and start talking to people. Set aside a couple minutes a day, a couple minutes a week, whatever it is to do it and make it happen because that's going to help you grow your network and and possibly your business, very likely your business. So we definitely recommend that. Otherwise, that's it. Follow us on the various networks, Facebook, LinkedIn, G+, Twitter, and so on. We're sharing cool stuff there and it's another place to interact with us. And that's it. Get out there, make things happen. I got nothing else to say is, you know, you get, get out there and make moves, guys. I mean, you know, you, you can work and work and work and study and study, but at some point you got to you gotta pull the trigger. And whether that's just getting out and looking at deals or calling people like Angelo suggests, you know, you, you got to make it happen. So uh, don't just be an academic, get out there and, and do it. So that's all I got for you. You want to add anything, Brandon? Nah, nah. Go out there and be passionate. That's all I got. Passion. I love it. I love it. All right, guys. This is Josh Dorkin from the Bigger Pockets podcast. Signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from biggerpockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.